Well, Merry Christmas to the James River Campus and the Pastor John. Merry Christmas to the Beaufort Road Campus and the Pastor Tom. My name is Mac Jordan, and I'm so excited to be here and to say God is good. All the time. And all the time? Now, let me ask you a question. Does it sound weird to say Merry Christmas the day after Christmas? No? It does to me. Maybe it's the way I was raised. Because way, the way I was raised, the day after Christmas is like the most depressing day of the year. I don't know why. It's like since August, we have been building up to Christmas Day. They've been decorating in stores. The music's been playing. The commercial started at Halloween. And it's been a slow build all the way up to December. And then we get the lights, we get the greenery, we get all the decorations and worship, and then Christmas Day comes, and it goes, and here we are. We have trash cans and recycling bins filled with paper and boxes and leftover food. We have shelves filled with all the gifts we got yesterday and already tired of. And now we look forward to taking down lights we look forward to taking down Christmas trees, and we are faced with winter. Long nights, cold days, and I'm from South Carolina, so I like neither. I like warm days and long days. So we, we're, here we are. We look back to yesterday, and we say, well, that was fun, but now we are faced with the real world. No more do we have the magic of Christmas we have to keep on moving and hoping that next year's Christmas will be even better. For me, the day after Christmas is a hard day. Yeah, I think that, that was true for Mary and Joseph. The day after Christmas, they woke up on the floor of a manger to the smell of animals. There were no more angels in the skies. There were no more shepherds worshiping. Jesus, all there was was two sleep-deprived parents changing the diaper of a newborn baby. I cannot imagine what an ancient Palestinian diaper would look like. It would be horrific in my mind's eye. They did not have a midwife. They did not have nurses or anyone to help them in the midst of this. And I often forget, and I think we often forget, that they still had to be counted in the census. So that day they had to get up and get in line. Now, I would imagine this counting would make the DMV look like heaven. <laughs> they would get in line, and there would be a few people up on some platform, and they would be counting with their fingers and writing it down. And they had a newborn in their hands this entire time. And then after the hours that would take, they would either go back to the manger or find an inn to stay the night, and then they would have to travel back home with a newborn. The day after Christmas is hard. And if Mary and Joseph are anything like me or like us, they had to have thought, was Christmas all a dream? Were there really angels in the sky? Were there really any wise men all around worshiping baby Jesus? Because nothing appears to have changed. People are still mean. The world is still cruel. Did the birth of a baby change anything? Because we have to remember Rome ruled with an iron fist. There was a God and his name was Caesar. And if no one was following Caesar, then they would be punished. If you were not a Roman citizen in that day, you were restricted in how you lived and how you spent your money. You were restricted in how you worshipped. For Mary and Joseph, they still walked in the world of darkness. I know they did not expect to run into Simeon that day at the temple. I know that Simeon did not expect to run into Mary and Joseph that day in the temple, but God works that way, right? In unexpected ways. Mary and Joseph had taken baby Jesus to the temple to do their Jewish custom, to, get, to purify him and to dedicate him as according to the Jewish faith. You were supposed to take your firstborn male after 40 days after he was born to the temple to sacrifice a lamb and a pigeon if you were wealthy, 
or two doves or two pigeons if you are not. This was to wipe away all the sins of this child and to set him on the path of God. Then, since this was the firstborn, they would dedicate him to God as dictated in Exodus 13 meaning that Jesus' life would be dedicated to God and he would serve in the role of a rabbi or a priest. He would live his life focused on God. Now, it is interesting to learn that in Numbers 18 that there is a caveat to this. If you wanted to buy back your child to come work on the farm or to come work as a carpenter, you could do that for a few shekels. But Luke makes no mention of that. Mary and Joseph left Jesus into the calling of following God. So in this time of ritual comes Simeon. And we get a touching scene of a man who is about to die, ready to die, holding a six-week-old baby. And as he looks at this baby, he says, This child is a consolation of Israel. This child is our hope. Now for Mary and Joseph, if they had any doubts about Christmas, they were blown out the window because the words consolation of Israel meant something. It meant that the messianic age had begun. What is the messianic age? It is the time in which all people, Jews and Gentiles, will come to know God and be saved. It is a time when the Jews will finally be comforted and find consolation as prophesied by Isaiah 40. It means that this baby will grow up to be a man and be king over all, even Caesar. But he would rule in a direct contrast of Caesar. Not with iron fists and political might, but with spiritual heavenly authority. It meant that salvation has come. These are the words that Mary and Joseph long to hear, that all of Israel has longed to hear. Because we often forget that the Israelites were oppressed. Can you hear their cries? Cries that were cried out for over hundreds of years. As the Babylonian Empire came in and took them from their land, and place them in a land that was not their own, and to customs that were not their own, to worship gods, Baal and others, that they did not know or did not want to worship. And they were there for a long time. Then came the Persians. And the Persians sent them back home, but they didn't know who they were anymore. They didn't know the law. They didn't know who Yahweh was. They didn't even have a wall around the city to to protect them. And so they had to rediscover who they were, only to have the Greeks to come by and conquer them. And the Greeks were ruthless. They sacrificed the priests, the rabbis, the children, the parents on altars covered in pig's blood to the point that the Jews actually rebelled and led to the Maccabean Rebellion, which eventually fell to the might of the Greeks. And then came the Romans. They've been crying for so long, surely they had to ask themselves, does God care? Is God real? Does God even exist? Hundreds of years we have cried out, where have you been, God? then on a night that was completely unexpected, a baby was born. A child was born in a manger and placed into a feeding trough. And even though nothing seemed to have changed, everything changed. We often ask the question, what is Christmas about? What is the reason for the season? For the ancient Jew and for the modern America, American, Christmas is about God answering the prayers of his people. 
It is about God answering the cries of his people in ways unexpected. How is it unexpected? Because Christmas is about God coming to earth to free the oppressed by becoming oppressed. It means that God comes into the world that walks in darkness and he walks in darkness to bring about light. It means that God chooses to walk with those who have no faith so that they may have faith. It means God bringing hope to the world by living in ways that we did not expect. Christmas is about God showing up. In the most difficult of times, it is about God showing up and answering our prayers. And so if that is true, then Christmas cannot be contained in 24 hours. It cannot be contained in greenery and lights. It cannot be contained in Christmas presents. Because Christmas is the presence of Christ with us. And if we have Christ with us, then Christmas is every day. There is no such thing as the day after Christmas for a Christian. Because God is still setting the oppressed free. God is still bringing identity to those who are lost. God is still bringing faith to those who have none. And God is still bringing hope and salvation. And we need salvation now just as much as they needed it back then. I've been reading Frederick Buechner. He's an American author, theologian, and pastor. And he said something in, in one of his sermons that just caught me off guard. He said, we as a people, we are partly in love with our own self-destruction. That we as human beings, we're partly in love with our own demise. That we care for and cultivate our own destruction. I was like, surely, surely that is not true. But then I, think, I thought about it. And I continue to think about it. And I realize that we choose to click on those adult websites, go to those nightclubs, shop at those street vendors that allow sexual slavery to happen every day. Did you know that we have more slaves today than in the history of the entire world? Because we keep choosing to finance that industry that puts boys and girls, men and women, into slavery all around the world. It's happening here in Richmond, Virginia, wherever you are watching, and all around the world. We choose to stockpile weapons of mass destruction and personal protection to protect ourselves, but also we have to be honest, because I need to be honest. We are prone to violence. We choose to harm our planet for profit, more worried about the dollar today than the planet that our children will inherit tomorrow. We choose to pick up the cigarette, the blunt, the bottle, the drug, with little consideration of what it will do to our bodies or our minds or our families when the addiction sets in. We choose to watch the movies where serial killers go and chase and kill teenagers. And we do that for entertainment. And we wonder why we are partly in love with our own self destruction because we are we choose not to fight for what is good we choose death over life so often we choose our own self destruction I'll never forget the day the last day I saw my mother alive I got the phone call from my dad that she was approaching her in. So I packed my family up. We got in the car and we headed down. We made a vacation week out of it. For years, since I was a child, the doctors had told my mom to stop smoking. But the addiction was strong. The identity of being a smoker was strong. And she just could not let it go. I got to my childhood home and walked into my childhood living room. And there she was on a hospital bed. A skeleton with flesh. I sat down in front of her, and she and woke her up because she had a hard time staying awake. And she started to mumble. 
And I leaned in and I said, what are you saying, Mom? She said, I love you. I love you. I had to detach myself at that moment, take off my son hat, put on a pastor's hat. And I said, Mom, I love you too. But I don't want you to stay here like this. We're going to be okay. It's okay to go be with Jesus. She said, I don't want to leave you. I said, I don't want you to leave me either. But we'll be all right. We went out to eat that night, and we went to go stay at my grandmother's house because of room. Got the call the next morning, June 21st, 2015, that my mom had passed away. She was 64 years old, the victim of lung cancer. And so many years smoking cigarettes. I still need Christmas today. We still need Christmas today and every day. We need Christ to be born into the nights of cancer, of COVID-19, of school shootings, of addiction, of national disaster and turmoil, mental distress, relational distress, grief, hardships. We need Christmas today just like we did yesterday. We need it every day. We need God to be present, answering our prayers in unexpected ways because God always answers our prayers in the best way. So here's my question for you. How do you need Christmas today? How do you need Christmas tomorrow? In the next week, we'll be taking down the lights and the greenery. But there is one thing that we will never have to take down, which is this truth. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Prince of Peace, Everlasting Father of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. Let me take back what I said at the beginning of the service, or my time. Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Let us pray. So, Lord, into this time, into this day after Christmas, but not really day after Christmas, may we truly consider how we need you now. How we need your life now. Your freedom now. Your hope now. Lord, into this time of invitation, speak to us, guide us, and lead us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.